Welcome to another edition of Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Russians have been mourning the 133 people killed in a Friday evening attack at a concert venue in Moscow. Many events across the country have been cancelled. Flags are flying at half mast. Many TV channels have updated their shuttles to focus on the realities. Though the Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, claims the men who attacked Moscow, who have been arrested, had tried to flee to Ukraine. We'll be talking later to the chairman, Nigerians and Diaspora Organization in Russia, Dr. Godwin Ibe, about the status of Nigerians living in the city. Plus, with many Nigerians heading towards Canada for greener pastures, we're asking the question, is learning French necessary to expanding your options? It is based off of celebrations of Le Francophonie in Lagos, where we caught up with the Canadian High Commissioner to Nigeria, Jamie Christoph. And a lot of you want to hear more about the visa issues. The High Commissioner has promised to discuss that at a later time. An act of terrorism has occurred on Russian soil, and it happened on Friday at the Crocus City Hall on the outskirts of the Russian capital, Moscow. It was a venue for a concert by the rock group Picnic. Everything was set until gunmen burst into the foyer just after 9 p.m. local time. A video at least showed four people shooting randomly before entering the hall and opening fire also as they entered the hall. Now, at some point, fire was seen inside the hall while glass on the top two floors of the seven-story building blew out. 133 people were confirmed dead, three of them children, while at least 140 others are being treated for varying degrees of injuries in hospital. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, even releasing footage to support its claim. Russian authorities on Saturday released pictures of those it says were the four attackers that night. It's not commented on the ISIS claims, but President Vladimir Putin says the attackers tried to flee to Moscow, helped by contacts there. The U.S. says it did warn Russia about the possibility of an attack earlier this month. As expected, the Ukrainian president is angry his country has been roped into this. In a statement on Saturday evening, he suggested a miserable Russian leader was more concerned about pinning the attack on Kyiv than in reassuring his own citizens. Leaders worldwide are condemning the attack and showing solidarity with Russia. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the attack in the strongest terms and conveyed his deep condolences to the bereaved families and the people and government of the Russian Federation. The United States sent its condolences to the victims of the attack. China's President Xi Jinping strongly condemned the attack and sent his condolences to President Putin. He stressed that China opposes all forms of terrorism. The European Union said it was shocked and appalled by the attack, and the attack was condemned by the United Kingdom and France. Even the Nigerian government, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, sent its condolences to Russia, commiserating with victims of the tragic attack. And this brings us to the question, were there any Nigerians hurt in the attack? Now, for this, I want to bring in Chairman, Nigerians in Diaspora Organization, Dr. Gordon Ibe, who joins us from Moscow. Dr. Ibe, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. Now, let's start from there. Were there any Nigerians injured in the attack on Friday? Do you know? Fortunately, we have no um, information of anyone being um, part or their relatives or families being um, the victims. Uh, we've reached out to as many as we can. We even reached out to members in other regions that are not in Moscow to be to cross check and to be certain that not, not, none of them and none of their family relatives were there. So we are very thankful uh, to God, and um, we know it's 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 just it's just a miracle that not even one. And we also cross-checked, not just with Afri uh, Nigerians, but also other African diaspora organizations who talked to the president of African diaspora, and, and no one seems to be a part of it. And we really thank God for that. We, we also know it's a very sad day, and we our heart goes out to all the victims, their family, and we share in their, we empathize with them and the, of our condolences. What have the last 48 hours been like, you know, for the Nigerian community living in Moscow in light of this attack, even before the arrest of the suspects? Because I'm sure there must have been some, an atmosphere of fear and terror 
knowing that you know these suspects were just running around roaming free and anything else could happen during the, that time of course uh, initially uh, everyone was trying to get to the bottom of the news and people were advised we also helped we also advised members not to go to public places and uh, to um, to stay indoors and to monitor the situation because the four terrorists at as at that time were still on the loose until they were found in the region of Bryansk heading towards Ukraine, not Moscow, Ukraine. Um, but uh, uh, over over time they were found and then uh, we've seen lots of solidarity, not just from the leaders around the world who have shown solidarity, which we support. We are still waiting for our president, although I heard um, the foreign minister put out something, uh, but I think it would be nice for the leader of Nigeria to also uh, offer condolences. But um, there's been lots of solidarity going on. For example, hundreds of people who lived around the area have been bringing hot food, uh, hot um, tea to all the rescue people, the police. It was just fantastic to see. A lot of people went out to donate their blood. In fact, the line for blood donation was as long. You would think that they are offering gold as gift. Uh, just as uh, for free um, on that place. The line was so, so long. A lot of people and um, a lot of people on the queue were like, what if my blood uh, saves someone who is just trying to grasp him for his life? That, that was just so much solidarity. Uh, that all taxi companies canceled all the fares from and to the venue. They canceled all, all, all taxi fares, both the ones done uh, before and after the event. Uh, all banks, in fact, initially we had a few banks who cancelled credits of the victims and their families. Now all other banks followed suit and cancelled the credit of all the victims and their relatives who were in the Croco City Hall. We also have uh, S7 Airlines, uh, which offered free transportation airline to all the victims and their family and everyone who were at the venue. We also have uh, the Moscow government, government who is paying the the victims of people who died, their relatives, 3 million rubles. And uh, for those who didn't die and who were just injured, they are paid 1 million rubles. And uh, for the others, I think they are paid like half a million, between half a million to 1, ruble, one million rubles. So there are lots of solidarity, lots of solidarity going on. People are going out of their way to do things to show that uh, we will never forget and we stand with Russia in this particular situation. And just to be clear, Dr. Ibe, this is probably the first time in a really long time that Russia is experiencing a terrorist attack on its own soil. Well, there's been many terrorist attacks, especially in the border regions of Russia, uh, drone attacks, uh, multi multiple launch rocket systems sent by oh. Ukraine to the border regions. Uh, so there have been lots of terrorist attacks and death, but on a, on a large scale, um, um, in in the capital uh, by terrorists. It hasn't been done for a long time. Recall that the people of Donbas and Lugansk have suffered shellings for over more than uh, eight, ten years, more than ten years, and uh, it's been reported the United Nations. So for them, they are kind of used to grief. But in the capital, Moscow, it's um, it's uh, it's uh, something that is not we we don't see every day. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a very sad and um, shocking incident in the capital. So, so why is the Russian government then refusing to acknowledge the Islamic State's involvement in this attack, even after the Islamic State did claim responsibility for the attack? Uh, for very many reasons. Uh, no one is saying that ISIS is not uh, involved, but they are saying that it's not predominantly ISIS and Ukraine is complicit. And I'll give you the reasons why. Because, uh, first of all, the confession of the terrorists, they were contacted by people on Telegram for financial reasons. So they do not belong to, basically to a terrorist group uh, or cell, uh, but they did this for, not for ideological reasons, but for financial reasons. The second reason is the type of firearm used. Uh, the, it was the first version of AK-12 automatic rifle. There are only four countries in the world that use that. That's uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, and Ukraine. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, number three. The when 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 the, um, the the this footage surveillance footage was seen, we can see that after every shot there was something like a dragon fireball, which showed the poor storage of the weapon. It means that it was stored in a catch 
for a long time. It means the the the, the terrorist event was planned for a long time, and uh, the, whoever used it was was suffering a shortage of ammunition and had to resort to that as a last resort. Um, and it also showed that the uh, and the uh, the weapon, the not the weapon, but the bullet inside was exploding before leaving the barrel. Uh, so it goes to show the poor storage and the long term planning of the incident. Also, the source of payment transfer, they received, they were promised 500,000 rubles, but they received half payment in advance. So the source of transfer, also the escape plan, uh, they, they were heading towards Ukraine and they had contacts in Ukraine, according to the FSB, uh, which, is, uh, which shows the complicit involvement of Ukraine. Uh, also, uh, they are not traditional suicide bombers or terrorists because these people, they either blow up themselves or they try to inflict maximum damage. But these four terrorists, they decided to save their own lives rather than inflict uh, maximum damage. This is very, very untraditional for a suicide bomber. Also, um, ISIS the, as well. there's a long history. Yeah, there's a long history of similar attack and escape plan. For example, in the case of assassination of Daria Dugina and Vladimir Tatarsky, there was an assassination attempt and they fled towards the Ukrainian border. So there's a long history. And last but not the least, uh, a lot of Ukrainian officials had said that they intend to kill as many Russians as possible. So that the, all those factors contribute to making an assessment that even if Ukraine is not directly responsible, they are complicit and aware of uh, what went on. Yes, and, and that means the Russian government is not buying anything the Ukrainian president is saying at this time. Um, he says he knew that, you know, Russia would, you know, turn the spotlight on Ukraine and would blame Ukraine for, for what has happened. Um, but I guess in, in, in the next few days, we'll understand better um, Ukraine's possible involvement in this. Uh, but just as we move forward and as we wrap up the interview, the Russian government is acknowledging um, uh, just wondering if they've acknowledged the solidarity and the condolences from other leaders around the world. Um, I know that they had looked to the U.S. and said, if you, knew, if you knew anything about this, now is the time to say something. And the U.S. said, we did say something at the, early, uh, at the start of the month. We did warn that there could be a possible attack on Moscow. Yes, um, you know, for when, when they, and there's an intelligence, for an intelligence to be credible, there has to be specific time and classification of the terrorists. For example, who did it, where, and what time. You cannot lock up your country forever. So it's impossible to classify anyone as credible or even intelligible without this. Otherwise, anybody, including you and me, can warn that one country in Europe is going to suffer a terrorist attack, even if we don't know where, we don't know how, we don't know. And we will probably will be right because there are the lots of... Um, 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 no immigration problem and uh, unrest among the local population. But for it to be classified as intelligence and credible, there must be specific time and there must be source uh, the classification of the terrorists. But did, neither of these were were, were uh, credible, and none, neither of these turned out to be true. For example, on March seventh was when the U.S. warned of this that in 48 hours. And uh, uh, people should avoid large gradient. But this is already March 23rd, or March 22nd, 23rd. Uh, it's it's uh, much farther than uh, the time. And they classified it as ISIS, but we can see that there's uh, a foreign intelligence involvement, possibly Ukraine. Uh, I don't know, but I think more information is pointing towards at least the knowledge of the complicit uh, uh, um, uh, complacence of Ukraine in, in this event. So uh, we're waiting for more information to draw conclusions, but I've given you what has been announced publicly by the FSB and uh, lots of uh, military journalists. Dr. Ibe, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, we'll be reaching out to you again in the course of the week to find out uh, any updates on the situation. Thank you for updating us and do stay safe, you and the other Nigerians in Moscow. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. Would you for a break up ahead? In celebration of French Language Day on March 20, we chat with the Canadian High Commissioner to Nigeria, Jamie Christophe, about the importance of learning a second language, even for diplomacy. Stay with us. Welcome back. International French Day is one observed on March 20 every year. It's observed within the International Organization of La Francophonie's 77 member states celebrate the French language and the culture. And here's a fact. There are over 269 million French speakers in the world and at least a million French speakers here in Nigeria. I'm one of them. Maybe you are too. 
The day was created in 1988 and celebrates the signing of the Niamey Convention in Niger on March 20, 1970. Here in Lagos, three countries spearheaded the celebrations, France, Canada and Switzerland. The Canadian High Commissioner to Nigeria, Jamie Christoph, is interestingly not French, but he speaks enough to be considered a speaker of the language. And in case you didn't know, Canada is a dual language country speaking English and French. But I'll leave the talking to the High Commissioner to tell us more. High Commissioner Jamie Christoph, thank you for speaking with us. Um, so your name is fully English. There's no hint of a French uh, heritage or origin anywhere. So no French blood in me. Uh, my family's from Macedonia and Eastern Europe. I was born in Toronto, but raised in Newfoundland in Eastern Canada. Um, but went to school in Quebec and um, it went to university in Quebec, I should say. And that was really my first opportunity to begin to learn in a tangible, intimate way, uh, a little bit about our French heritage and culture. Uh, English is my mother tongue, but, um, but of course, in order to represent the government of Canada, uh, we're all expected to be uh, functional to a large degree in, in both official languages. Well, I would say in terms of the French language between Nigeria and Canada, one might think uh, there's not much of a connection. But of course, as you know, Nigeria uh, finds itself in the heart of, of West Africa, uh, where surrounding countries uh, predominantly speak uh, French. So um, for me, the way I look at uh, language, it's a door into culture. Obviously, in, in Nigeria, I, uh, I conduct myself predominantly in English. Uh, but as I um, look to explain Canada to Nigeria and Nigerians, I do like to underline the duality of not just our languages, but our multicultural society with England, you know, the UK and France being founding countries of Canada. And I think it's, it's important to explain that uh, to, to Nigerian Nigerians. So is it necessary for Nigerians who are coming to Canada to understand both languages? Canada being a, a dual ling lingua country? Yes. So that's a good question. And, um, the vast majority of Nigerians find themselves immigrating to cities like Toronto or Calgary, which by and large, although multicultural cities by and large are, are known to use English as the working language. But, you know, I think when we look at language again, um, as not just a way to communicate. Uh, it's, it's also a tool, a professional tool. And, you know, when I, I speak to young Nigerians about their aspirations in traveling and working and maybe moving to Canada, just to underline that uh, perhaps learning uh, French uh, is not just a benefit in understanding Canada, it's a tool to possibly secure employment. So it's, um, you know, as, we, as I'm here in Lagos right now, in part to support uh, the Francophonie and the events around uh, this important week. It's one of the messages um, I try and underline to uh, Nigerians. Just, um, you have the benefit of being in West Africa. Uh, Nigerians, as you and I both know, extremely industrious, extremely diligent, uh, studious. Uh, let's, let's add maybe French language uh, to the list of uh, a professional um, you know, uh, attributes uh, that Nigerians aspire to because it will open doors, I have no doubt. So French is a language of diplomacy, you know. So when you meet with Nigerian officials, do you find that they're eager to either understand or learn the language? Um, I would say that to the extent um, we touch on culture, uh, yes, they, they are interested in knowing how we manage uh, the duality of our of our language. And um, again, language is only part of, I think, what makes Canada uh, an, an interesting and compelling country and a wonderful one. It's a multicultural country and, and you know, it's something that I have discussed with Nigerian officials. Nigeria also being uh, multicultural, of course, many, many tribes, ethnicities and religions make up uh, this wonderful country. And so that's something we share in common with Nigeria. And there are certainly any number of discussions uh, we can have where we can 
celebrate those things and learn from one another about how to incorporate all those wondrous elements in one country. And finally, can you tell us a secret? Um, French-speaking Canada or English-speaking Canada, which is your favorite? I've spent time in both, and we grow up uh, understanding and celebrating uh, both parts of our, our heritage, and it's grown beyond the two founding countries into much more of a multicultural country. But clearly, uh, English and French are founding uh, languages of uh, our country. And, you know, those languages, again, just aren't uh, ways to communicate. There are values imbued in them in those as well, and it's reflected in our laws and in our uh, societal norms. And so... Um, That's a very diplomatic answer. Thank you, thank you. High Commissioner Crystal. The UN Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The US had refrained from voting the measure, which also calls for the release of hostages. The move signals a shift in US-Israel relations, although the White House insists it is not a policy shift. In the meantime, the U.S. Justice Department and the FBI says millions of Americans' online accounts have been cut up in a sinister Chinese hacking plot that targeted U.S. officials. Seven Chinese nationals have been charged with enacting a widespread malicious cyber attack campaign. The operation allegedly went on for over a decade. According to the Justice Department, the hackers targeted U.S. and foreign critics of China businesses and politicians. And finally, the ruling coalition candidate in Senegal's presidential election, Amadou Ba, has considered defeat in the just concluded presidential election. Ba called Basiru Dioma Faye to recognize the opposition candidate's win in Sunday's presidential election. Candidates need to gain more than 50% of votes to win the first round, else it goes to a runoff. This is where we end the program today. I'd like to read your thoughts and comments. And if you are Nigerian living in Moscow, do let us know your safety status and how you're doing with the recent happenings. The addresses to reach me on are on your screen. I'm Amarachi Obani. I'll see you next time.